My name is Sam Spiegelman, on three national recruiting analyst, and you are watching the Fan View Podcast. Y'all already know what it is. Another episode, Fan View Podcast. When is it? Fan View Podcast. Ooh, you sound like Ohio State over there. I said, I can't do it. The Fan View Podcast. Man. Come on, man. <laughs> sound like the Buckeyes over there. Wolverine fan, G Sports. Can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all know this. The Fan View Podcast. Listen, I'm that boy Fred. G Sports back at it. Y'all already know what it is. Listen, get subscribed. Fan View Podcast if you on IG. It's Fan View Podcast if you on YouTube. It is Fan View NOLA if you are on Twitter. And don't forget to subscribe to G Sports. I can't help you if you underneath the rock. <laughs> We all got social platforms, baby. We all have TikTok. We all have IG. We all got Twitter now. We all got Facebook. I got to keep y'all locked and loaded, baby. But y'all get locked and get subscribed. And don't forget New Orleans. Thank y'all for New Orleans Talk Network for sponsoring the podcast. No doubt. No doubt. y'all in the market to get your next podcast film, start a <clears> podcast, <throat> don't forget to subscribe to New Orleans Talk Network. Trust me. But G Sports, we got a special guest in the building. Man, we got one of the hardest working men in the business, man. Yes. National recruiting analyst from On Three Sports, Sam Spiegelman, in the building. Uh, g- glad to get him on the Fan View podcast, man. I know you've been working. I know you've been working your ass off uh, since <laughs> last spring to now, man. With recruiting, football season is upon us. Yes. Uh, the, the the week one of the regular season starts tomorrow. Um, I know you you're back and forth between Texas and Louisiana. Mm. Uh, glad to have you on the podcast, Sam. I know there's a lot of things you could be doing, but for you to come fill a show with us, man, and, and kind of give us your expertise Absolutely. on. On what's going on in the football world and recruiting, uh, we we deeply appreciate it. But we like to start our podcast off, man, talking about right. your journey. Um, you know, Sam, I think I probably met you maybe what six, seven years ago uh, when I first got into the media game, and you were somebody I watched closely just by how professional you are and how you go about your business and, and what you was doing with rivals at the time. Um, but take us back, man. You know what got you into journalism, man? What got you so passionate about what you do, and how have you elevated, you know, so fast? Um, in a short amount of time. Sheesh. Man, well, I appreciate you guys having me on. And um, yeah. I, like I said, I was when G hit me up, I was like, man, dude, I, I, I was telling my wife, I was like, we got to change out our plan. I got to get you to the airport. <laughs> I'm doing this, man. Thank you. Appreciate that. Appreciate yeah, it. Like, Thank, I, like, you. Thank G, you. I, me and G go way back, and yeah. I'm happy to be here with you guys. You guys do a great job. Um, yeah, I, I grew up, you know, my, my older sister was, was kind of like my idol growing up. You know, mm-hmm. your siblings are, are who you look up to. And she wanted to be like a, she wanted to be the editor of the newspapers. I was like, oh, that sounds like cool. But mm-hmm. I kind of only really like sports. That was the only thing that interested me. Um, right. So, you know, from high school to college, I was, I grew up, I wanted to be a sports writer. I didn't know what that meant. I thought right. I'd be covering. So, and, and how old were you when you started feeling like this? Oh man, 12, 13 years Damn, old, you fourteen. Know that early? Yeah, yeah. I mean, listen, you are the uh, time infl- picking you these days, brother. Yeah, <laughs> I- influenced by my sibling. I like exposed to only what she was exposed to. Right. And my only other, my only thing that differed me was that I like sports. I remember I right. did like a like a full front page recap of like the Giants winning the Super Bowl when when Eli beat the Patriots, and like mm-hmm. to me that that's what I thought I was gonna do for forever. Um, but when I was in college, I went to the University of Maryland. Um, I went to go cover Stephon Gilmore. Mm. Ah. Um, excuse me. He, he excuse, me. Excuse, excuse me. Stephon Diggs. Diggs. Stephon oh. Diggs. Stephon Diggs. At, right. Gil- at Gilmore. Um, gotcha. At his high school, Gilmore. Right. Gotcha. Um, and, man, that changed out the energy. I mean, that was out in D.C., um, right. in the Baltimore area, in the Maryland area. Um, and, you know, where I grew up on Long Island, New York, no one came to my football games growing up except for my mom and dad. Right. right. You know, to football see. Football not really talked about in New York. Yeah, no. but it's but, but, basketball. But, but if you get the rock mm-hmm. park. We're talking oh, about yeah. basketball. Yeah, it's 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 a basketball, Freestyle, yeah. basketball, lacrosse. Right. Um, f- football is just not it's just not a part of the of the culture there. And and when I was in DC, um, it just it blew my mind away. One to see someone like Stephon Diggs as a high schooler. Mm-hmm. I've know. heard he was lights out. Not just in you know high what school, he, he if we saw out. him today we be we be raving about him in the same light we talk about these same five stars right now because that's exactly what he, he was. was. That's about, about him. And and that's what that's what kind of captured me in. I was like you know what. 
the thing about high school is the thing I also learned in that journalism class is you always get to talk when you talk about kids, you're talking to them about them in a positive light, mm-hmm. right. which is great because real journalism can be real hard. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So you're talking about you gotta kids. Be you got to be critical. You have to be critical, but there's always a positive light. Right. Um, you're talking about kids and, and in recruiting, you know, like, which I fell into and I'll get into that in a sec. Um you know, it's, it's a lot of different ways to do it. You can kind of make it your own, which I've always, I appreciate you saying that earlier. I try to go about things my own way. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, you know, I, I got a job with the times Picune. Um, I moved to new Orleans in, in 2012. So mm-hmm. what led you to moving from the East coast to, to the, the South? South though? It, what made you, what made, what well, made you step woman. out on faith like that? The woman. Well, Gotta be a woman. Oh, that's the my, that's the my, food. that's my wife. Um, <laughs> I told that's you. my wife. Yeah. Told you. But I met with I met with Marcus Carmouche of the of the Times Picayune, and I told him what I did, what I wanted to do, and he said, "Give it time." And a month later, he t- he called me. I got in my car. I drove here um, in 2012. Started working with incredible people like Jimmy Smith and Jared right. Roser and Andrew mm-hmm. Lopez, who's now covering the NBA hey, for Pelican, ESPN. Yeah. Yeah. Like, give me a yes. break. I, guess- I, re- I remember when I first started Pelican. off uh, covering the state championships for basketball. And and he was covering the state championships, and then to see him elevating the game, and now uh, you know seeing him on ESPN yeah. and covering the Pelicans, man, it just is a testament to his all work too. And, and the way that him and Jared and Jimmy did recruiting, they said, "Hey, would you want to do some some stories like this?" I said, "Heck, yeah!" yeah. Right. Um, you know, I did stories on Booga, Booga, and Speedy. Um, you know, Cy Martin, I remember from Tulane to an LSU offer. You know, he's had some crazy stories yeah. in, in this incredible city. Um, and then I got laid off. Um, I got a job covering the LSU beat for a startup called SEC Country. I remember yep, that. Yep. Mm-hmm. I remember that. And they said, you know, hey, you don't have to just do LSU. You can just kind of cover the state. And I was like, okay, great. great. That's how I ran into guys like Greg Brooks, who was just named captain of LSU. Yep. A, a three-star, a little bit under-recruited because uh, yep. of his size, yep. but had an NFL pedigree, was a continual playmaker, offense, defense, special teams at West Jeff. At West Jeff. And then when he signed at Arkansas, you were like, Okay, maybe I can do this recruiting stuff at a little, maybe a higher yeah. clip. I mm-hmm. think I know what I'm looking for by now, mm-hmm. and I'm very fortunate. From there, they got an opportunity at Rivals, and then uh, I guess a that's little. That's where bit I remember of, you from. I said I remember Sam from Rivals, right? Yeah, I knew Sam. Sam put his stamp on that Rivals. I was like, man, yeah. this, whatever Sam got to say. It well, bef- yeah, the the one I'm last post-time. hurdle I had to get over, I did get laid off from SEC country one second time, um, and that you know it just gives you a lot of experience. You know what? Facts. The media game is is mm-hmm. it's tough, it's and tough. it's tough. forever changing. It's, it's ever changing. It's, that's, a, that's a incredible way to put it, um, and it's it's unforgiving. No matter how hard you work, sometimes it's you know we're talking about recruiting. Sometimes it feels like you're doing it in the dark and no one's even looking at you. Yeah. So um, got a, got caught on with rivals. Um, that turned into on three about five or six years later, and uh, I'm just blessed to be where I am, and I, I get to cover kids that play football for a living. And like G said, the best part about it now is football season's here. Yeah. Yeah. So the guy that started rivals. Soul rivals and started on, on three, three, correct? Correct, Shannon Terry. Gotcha. gotcha. And on three has become a major, major, major platform in a short amount of in time. In a short amount of time, short in terms amount of, of people time. being connected, people getting information about recruits and and things going on with different players. Man, talk about the experience of people being with on three and how how fast you've grown in this business with on three. Yeah, I think August might have been our, our two year anniversary. Right. We're, still, we're, still, we're still a baby. We're a startup. Pioneer stage. Yes. Um, but I'll tell you what, it's 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 a lot of pressure. It's a lot faster of environment of a work environment. Um, but you know, this is this is kind of you know this is as close to being a, a journalist I feel like as I've ever gotten to be in my in my career because I mean, talking to G before. I talk to G about this every time we're on the right, sideline. Re- right. Recruiting is is wild. And the people that you meet and people that are involved in these recruitments, whether they're a coach that's in the mix for a five-star player or, yes. you know, just a coach on the outside that's, that's at Southern who's maybe getting an opportunity at UL that right. in five years could be the director of recruiting at, at Houston. You have Correct. no idea how no these idea. things work out. No idea. So, th- I mean, the biggest thing is relationships and yep. – and, um, like I said, this this new role at On Three has been great because I get to form a lot of new relationships with people I've always either wanted to work with or never had a chance to. I've gotten to meet a lot of new people or kind of rekindle some relationships. And now I feel like I'm a professional like cr- like detective in the world of recruiting for On Three, which is which is pretty fun. But I do want to ask you a question. I know G gonna have a lot of questions. I ask this question. <laughs> it's, it's important to me. Growing up as a kid, right? Journalism was a was a, a very important you know thing. Like when you see somebody put content out there who's a journalist, it's like it was law. It was credible. Mm-hmm. Everybody won't be content creators now. 
how hard it is for you to navigate being a journalist in this content created. Again, we're, we're creating content, but in this content generation age where you still have to stick out like a sore thumb as mm-hmm. a journalist where everybody out here got opinions. Now, at one point in time, everybody didn't have an opinion. We're looking inside the newspaper. This is the beat writer. This is the guy who's a journalist. That's what it is. Twitter created it. Yeah. Yeah. Kill everything. <laughs> but how, <laughs> but what? X, 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 X. God. Now, the artist formerly known as Twitter. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. There you go. I, I like how you put that. But how hard it is now to still maintain to being a journalist in this social media era? Well, you know, G said it before, and G knows that I, I can get angry about things too because you're right. You don't. You don't need to go to. You don't have to have a, a journalism degree or say that I right. work for the Times Picayune to break news. It's about really journalism is about relationships, relationships for real. and it's about credibility, and that's yes. the, that's the second yes. part of it. Um, and you don't need to, again. You don't need to show your degree or say who you spoke to at the door to, to break news or, or provide valuable uh, intel. Right. The thing about it is is trying to decipher who you can who is trustworthy, yep. or who is a trustworthy source, and yep. and with platforms, everyone has a way to to put their thoughts out there. Right. You know how do you distinguish like who I trust and where and are they someone that's a that's that's led me in the wrong way before Mm -hmm. um is it someone that talks to people that are in the know or do they present things in a fair and and equitable way that's that's telling and i think those are like you said it's really difficult because usually we would rely on you know a blue check mark or the beat writer Mm -hmm. hey this is how it is but it's not if if everything was as cookie cutter and clean as that then we'd be living in a different world right um you know i to to me it's all about credibility and it's all about accountability and i just as a person who follows a lot of media guys and a lot of media people, whether it's on social platforms or what have you, man, it's just becoming tough because everybody's trying to rush to be first, mm-hmm. to get information, to get news out, mm-hmm. whether it's whether it's correct or not, whether all the details are right or not. Everybody's in a rush to be first, and it just makes it tough today to be a real journalist because while you're doing the research and trying to get the facts done properly, somebody's just putting out information. Yep, right. right? And you may come – as the fifth or sixth story who breaks this now, but no one's looking at you, but you got the facts. Right. You facts. got the truth. Facts. And it makes it tough for your job because people out there putting out information about something unconfirmed just to be first, just to get people to click. <laughs> but the journalist is taking the time to do the real work. And when one point time, it, it was only the journalist doing the work. So when it came out, it was like, okay, we got the news. It probably been happened two, three days ago, but the facts are not as breaking. Now you hit news, now. In, 20 minutes. And you're like, come on, man. It, 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 we're in that kind of age now. And there's a part of me who, maybe I'm a little older man now. I don't like it. It yeah. bothers me. And, 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 and Fred, you know, you make a key point when you talk about that dynamic of media and journalism. Um, I know for myself, it's been plenty of time where I've had people tell me certain things as far as who, who a kid's about to commit to or... Yep. Who their top school is, yep. whatever it might have been, right? Be. And a lot of the, I ain't gonna say a lot of the time, half of the time, I'm skeptical of putting it out, yeah, because I don't know if it's real true or not, you, if, and you can't you confirm know, it. Yeah, and and, and there have been times where it has been true, yep, but it also have had times where it where it wasn't true. true. And I'm glad, man. I'm glad. I'm I glad they put it out because now you're killing your credibility. And and you know one thing I pride myself on, and you know. Is for trying to be as professional as I can, and part of that is making sure that your 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 your, your content and what you're putting out is concrete Incredible. and it's it's facts behind it. You know, when I a lot of time when I do break something, if I you know it's not a whole lot because right. I like to get it from the horse's mouth. Correct. Either the, the the parent, the kid, or the head coach. Correct. You know, I I don't like getting it from cousins and no uh, people they're friends with because things are changing. Sometimes people t- they blow smoke to other people. Yeah. And I don't ever want to be that guy where people say, "Man, GB putting this out, but it don't all the way it don't always be accurate." And right. so, um, that's a key point you make. But I kind of want to go back to something that Sam said. Man, you talked about how you got laid off twice in your journalism career. And as we know, man, no matter what you're doing, whether you you playing football in the NFL, you getting cut, uh, whether you trying to be a lawyer, a doctor, whatever, you know, we go through some adversity and some hurdles in our careers. Uh, talk about staying motivated, man, and want to stay in journalism and not let those layoffs um, discourage you and, and go take another career path. Yeah, there. well, there were definitely a lot of times where I did think about taking another career path. Um, you know, my first time I got laid off, I was I was a kid. I was still young. Um, 
And I was like, maybe I should go, you know, I live in New Orleans. Maybe I should try to go to Tulane Law or, or something that's a little bit more stable. I can make more money. I mean, Whew. journalism might be fun. <laughs> right. But it's a, certainly not the most lucrative career, even if you are at the at the best of your game. And there are, there are people that are high on the chain that, that I don't think make enough the same amount of money in the same oh, pay range as, as high-priced Correct. attorneys. Like, trust me. Um, so it was, it was, it was definitely trying. I remember I talked to my dad a lot of times about, about trying something new, but like I said, I, I grew up, I was kind of, you know, focused. I was kind of only driven toward, toward writing about sports and somehow, you know, putting my, my taste on it for whatever right. it was worth. You know, I was a stupid kid that just happened to have a passion for it, but I always felt like, you know, just talking to my friends or, you know, talking to, G- I always felt like when we have a discussion, I'm like, yeah. this is like, isn't this like a good conversation? Yeah. Like that's right. how I felt when I was a kid. And I felt that way till now at 33 years old. Um, so I, I gave it another shot. And, and when those, I, I mean, there were times where I was writing for five or six or seven different places at the same time, just trying Ooh. to, trying to just get Ooh. money, money. I had to pay my bills and I had to, try to you know i talked about my wife well she was my girlfriend back then and she certainly doesn't have cheap taste um so i'm trying to impress her and and keep her you know interested in me and i also i work friday nights and saturdays i like not not a great catch to be perfectly honest with you um but you know i I think it's it's if you don't i don't want to say if you don't know anything if if you're driven and you really believe you have to give things at least second chances i mean i believe in third and fourth chances Again, ask my significant other. You get as many chances as you want. You have to believe in second chances at Correct. least. And then when – I'll tell you this. When I got laid off the second time, it came within three weeks of me closing on my first house Damn. and proposing to that aforementioned wife. <sighs> and, I, and it happened. I got the news in Baltimore um, with my in-laws, my future in-laws. And I and I was real. My 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 father-in-law is a is a former Navy man. Um, Stern. Yeah, I, I, it wasn't it wasn't about to be a, a great conversation. No. This um, man. But you know what? At that point in my career, you know, after after multiple stints, you know, of, of trying new things and and kind of establishing some credibility, maybe not a lot, but mm-hmm. some people knew who I who was. You were dope. I felt that I would have a chance to at least continue, at least in this field, and you know, each step you know, would elevate you to the next. And and no longer was I at the bottom of the ladder anymore, just trying to hold on. I was at least somewhere in the middle where I had a fighting chance to at least continue my career. And I thought, you know, at least so far, at least I've, I've climbed at least another ladder to make it to another profession, you know, cross your fingers. Right. Um, but w- if it certainly had its trials and tribulations, to put it lightly. I, I can, I have a real appreciation for what you just said. And I asked that for a reason because the, the times that we're living in, everybody think, you know, whatever career you choose, that you're going to have this overnight success. You know, we live in a, a, a microwave society, and Fact. nobody wants to go through the adversity and the trials and tribulations that come with, you know, uh, a career like journalism or whatever it is whatever that you're doing be. with your life. Whatever you know, it, it just comes with a level of adversity that's going to come. And it's not what you go through, it's how you handle it when you're going through and it. And I think that was an excellent way you just put that, Sam. Not, Appreciate just, you. not just that, but people think that because... You know, you branded yourself and you become a, a brand name to in recruiting. People think your role was just straight. <clears throat> People thought your role was like this. And Everybody posting their success and nobody posting their failures. <laughs> Preach. <laughs> Tell and me. so everyone thought your role was just this, 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 this. When we're at it, the role was boom, 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 boom. And no one got the chance to see that or witness that. But all they see now is the outcome. They see the results. But they didn't really see you behind closed doors. You know, you basically shooting in the gym. You putting the hard work and the hours in. They didn't see you up being two in the morning, you know, studying this, studying that, doing doing everything it takes to be what you become. And all they think, they think everything is given. I said, dog, things are earned, man. I to earn it. Things are earned. And I just think that we live in such a, like, like a G. Luther. There's such a microwave society that everyone's looking to be some overnight success in whatever occupation they're in. And it don't work. We see that in recruits. Yeah. They think that, okay, I can go out here on Friday nights when the lights are on and go out here and just turn it on. Brother, you wouldn't get it in that practice. <laughs> right. Or in, or in the summer. In or in the summer. Season. Or in the off season. Or Monday through Thursday leading into Friday. Yep. You wouldn't get it in. Yeah. And thinking because Friday night you did it one game, well, oh, I could do it again. Or oh, you keep cheating yourself. You keep doing it. Keep trying. Right. This, this, this is not how it works. You're going to run against... Some kids who trying to 
get where you are. You may be a four or five star recruit. You got a three star kid trying to make a name for himself who's been putting the work in, and you haven't. And he about to show you up on this Friday night. And all of a sudden, you're looking at, well, I ain't commit. Well, he about to. Right. <laughs> right. I know a lot of kids and parents ask me this this question often, uh, you know, as it pertains to on three rivals, 24-7 sports, ESPN. One of the first things kids like to ask me, especially early on in their career when they're first getting into high school, is how do I become a four-star? How do I, how do I become a five-star? How do I get ranked? Um, you know, and I and I, I I try to give them as much information as I can to the best of my ability, but the fact of the matter is, um, you know, it, it it's that's not my realm when it comes to you know figuring out who's gonna be the number one player in the state for on three or twenty four seven sports or what have you. Right. Um. For, for for as long as you've been doing this, Sam, um, uh, what's what's your process or as as a whole, you know, whether it was when you was arrivals or now with with on, on three. three. You know, what is y'all process when it comes to trying to figure out who's going to be a four-star, who's going to be a five-star, and how should we rank these certain kids? So that is a, a, a loaded question, but I'm going to I'm trying to break it down <laughs> as much as I can. So, first of all, at On3, at, at Rivals, I was the guy who put stars on everyone, whether they signed with UL, Grambling, or, or Georgia and Alabama. Right. Okay. Now I am just part of the machine. You know, I am I am out there Thursdays, Fridays, Saturdays, as, as often as I can. And my input, I you know, it, it has sway. But I am not a final decision maker anymore. So let's put that out there. Okay. First off, that that's only for company guidelines. Uh, right. Let's first talk about like how do I become a three star? How do I become a five star? It okay. all begins with exposure, and then Gino's this as well. Um, you know, everyone wants to like start their varsity career as a freshman, and and you know start getting fifteen offers, <laughs> and, yeah. and and if the world worked like that, it'd be so easy. Yeah, and, and would become so an ma- anomaly. So many par- <laughs> parents would be happier. We'd all be sleeping later in the morning. It'd be great. Right. Um. You know, every first of all, every recruit, but every you know, every varsity player who gets recruited rather has a different process. There are there are the we're talking about Dominic Dominic McKinley before this. Well, his recruitment really didn't start till after his junior season, which is more of a yeah, which yeah, is yeah. more of a traditional pace. Then you have guys like Derek Stingley Jr., the number one player in the state and in the country, it's who is recruited. Or Jakeem Stewart, who have 20 yeah. offers before they play a varsity down of football. Every situation is different. And it doesn't mean that there's a right way or a wrong way. It just means that it's different. So in terms of exposure, if hey, if you had a, a, a breakout sophomore season and you're, you're trying to get ranked, you know, likely if you have varsity film, it's about your exposure. If you have varsity film, coaches are going to be contacting you if you're a playmaking sophomore. If coaches are, are contacting you, that means your high school coaches are actively contacting them and, and people are going to try to get you to campus and we're going to get buzz of you naturally. It just happens organically. Correct. You can go to camps. First of all, like you said, I'm at games every single week. G is at games every single yeah. week. If you are the best player on that field and there is someone with a camera there, like, all it takes is a cell phone there, <laughs> yep. it's going to get on the internet. And if you do it often enough, more people are going to come to your games, you're going to be in the paper, and people are going to hear about you. Right. That also happens. And then there's the exposure side. You can go out of your way to make sure that people see you. I mean, um, on three doesn't hold camps, but Rivals holds camps, Under Armour holds camps, yep. um, You know, Nike had camps for a while. There's, a, there's an array of different ways... Colleges have camps. Colleges have camps. I'm about to say, you go and, to Tulane, and, LSU yeah. camp. And the, the great thing about the state of Louisiana is, is under Ed Orgeron, they started to work all together. So UL and La Tech yep. and Tulane mm-hmm. and Fritz and, and Brian Kelly and Frank Wilson, they're all in the same venue about four or five or six times between, uh, I think it's May 31st usually for Tulane until the last camp at LSU. Um, and they, they all – if you get an offer, I guarantee people are going to eventually get you ranked. Yep. Now, here's the thing that kids also fail to – realize and i get it they're kids i might live in louisiana but that does not mean that it's like i can get everyone in the state ranked you know overnight like sometimes we might have seen you in a camp we want to get your measurements we want to see how your varsity Mm -hmm. film looks Mm -hmm. you know like sometimes there's just a waiting order that there's no rankings that are made until after your junior season and you know it maybe you're you're just like four games in we have to just wait for the other six before we do the entire cycle no doubt so it's sometimes kids take it personally and and more often than not it is mm-hmm. never personal um it's more about taking the time to do it for every every kid in louisiana every kid in mississippi every kid in california so on and so forth um 
as far as the actual ranking system, what makes a five star prospect? Well, that's because there's only 32 in the country. There's only 32. Yeah, so the ranking system, and this is you know why a three star prospect is 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 an impressive feat, is because that may, that means it's a power five grade, it's a draftable grade. Gotcha. Um, a four star means that you're probably looking at the second round, a third round, fourth, you know, ish, um, or you're on the fence of that five star ranking. There's a mm-hmm. lot of a lot of four stars in the country. Those are extremely great players, and then those five stars represent at most. 32 potential first round Our picks. picks. Now we are saying these are the either the best 32 players in high school football or in some cases the guys who have checked this 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 and all the the pre-qualifications of a of you know parent pedigree, uh, multiple sport athlete, mm-hmm. incredible testing numbers. Mm-hmm. Uh, you could have measured in with a with a freaky wingspan yeah, or right. you know or you're just one hell of a football player and no one can stop you on Friday nights and then you did it as a, most importantly as a senior eval. That's the last thing I'll before I hand it back to you guys is if you get ranked as a sophomore and you don't like it. That's a big deal if you get ranked. No, no. You don't like one. We, thank you. <laughs> yeah. And if you don't like your ranking, you, Usually, there's only one person in the country who ever likes their ranking. If you're just content to be a four star, that's probably the the first sign that something is wrong. You should all be, all these kids should be striving to be the number one player at their position or at on and or in the country at that point. So the five stars, there's a lot that goes into it, and and it, the cool thing about the recruiting process, or at least the the evaluation side. It is it evolves almost monthly from the time you first get ranked until the time you sign, and that's a that's a lot of time to either move up, to move down, or or stay st- stay stable. But usually that trajectory tells you about the kid. If someone who starts at 50 ends up at one, it's a pretty steady flow. Or right. but it might tell you a lot of someone who starts as unranked until they're going into their senior season and then ends up at 80 in the country, like Quincy Wiggins. Quincy Wiggins. Oh, yeah. and that might tell you a lot about that athlete too. I think that one of the things with these kids, and they, 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 I, I ain't going to say they don't idolize these anchors, but obviously even as a kid, you, you pay attention to who the five-star kids was. But I think a lot of kids' misperception of being a five-star is that all because you are not a five-star doesn't mean that you're not a good player. I think a lot of kids get this mindset that if you're not a five-star, if you're not a four-star, that you're undervalued. And I think that's just – it's a big cliche. It's a myth. And so we got – there's a lot of players who are three-star prospects come out of high school, go to college, put on a show, go in there, compete. I just think kids just have a misunderstanding of the interpretation of ranking. All because you're three-star doesn't mean that you're not better than the five-star. The five-star just may have the measurables and they might be, been have more exposures. It doesn't mean that you can't out-compete them. I just you, think a lot of kids get this misconception. You ever, you ever hear uh, Brian Kelly say, look at our – four-star cornerback freshman starting mm-hmm. as soon as you get to college it doesn't when, first of all when they re, when, when college coaches recruit you they don't say we want you because you're a five-star like they're going to tell you why they want you and the the and it's it's easier said than done because we're all 30 plus and we're all adult men right right um, we're adults and when you're when you're 15 or 16 or 17 you know you it's it's hard to to internalize what this means but if a coach views you as a first round pick or sees the future in you then you should be talking to that coach and if you're upset with your ranking that's that's another issue to be to be dealt with because what that coach that coach knows more than anyone ranking from a media standpoint i'm mm-hmm. perfectly comfortable saying that out loud and if it should never be an. Uh, I'm so concerned with. I'm only a three star because, like I said, three star means draftable. It means power five potential and dozens, thousands. I mean, hunt, you can name countless, countless that have outproven the ranking. It is just a ranking, and when it starts to be, no one, you're, you're no one's competing for rankings. You're competing to win on Friday night. So I always tell kids, you know, worry about the ultimate goals about winning a state championship, improving your craft, and getting to college. And then let's have this conversation. And if you're still unhappy, then we can talk about it. And I would say 9 out of 10 kids never really bring it up again. Mm -hmm. And the kids that do often don't really pan out. Yep. Now, a lot of college coaches say, you know, when they get in these press conferences that they don't pay attention <laughs> to the rankings, that they don't pay attention to the – Don't listen you know, to them lies. I right? swear they all lies. Right. <laughs> but, Sam, we know better. <laughs> we know better, right? How, how much do you think these college coaches do pay attention to these rankings from on three, from 24-7 sports, from ESPN? Well, especially once they get them committed, they really care. Um, I, I can – you know, people that, you know, I respect a ton fight with me a lot about, about rankings and – 
Um, you know, people like literally I'm the people I'm thinking about in my head are some of the coaches that I would call right now if I wanted an eval on a player, an unbiased opinion. At the same time, I've also heard these people because they are still human beings admit that they are wrong. I've also yep. heard what would what, what we start this about with the stars? If you saw an eval of a kid as a junior, um, you know, playing, uh, let's say I went to I went to car as a junior and I and I saw Teron Francis and I said, Man, that kid dropped three passes. Um, a little bit, you know, a little bit of trouble getting out of his breaks when he went against Wallace Foster. Couldn't get a release, and uh, you know, all the hype that Bryce gave me. You know, it sounds like maybe Bryce has just hyped him up a little bit. Come on, and you saw that. That's a one-game sample size. One game sample size. You, you can be wrong because we we both know Teron Teron Francis is a different level yep. caliber receiver. Just, if anyone listening at home, I think the world of the kid. I think he's yep. wide receiver one in the state for next year. It just ba- goes to show DK Metcalf. Yeah, ki- kids develop. They are still children, and they're 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 student athletes developing at their own clip. Correct. And you know, like you might these are college coaches. They might go to one game, or or you know, they really have people under them watching the tape every single week. They have a lot on their plates to be following. You know every single week what a kid is doing in and out. So when they start to, they start to maybe get a little bit more defensive. Now, I, per- I understand that. They, 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 it's because in their building, they view the kid higher. It's the same way in 32 NFL draft rooms in, in April or May. Right. They might have viewed you know Bryce Young as a number one quarterback, and some might have viewed Anthony C. Richardson or, or C.J. Stroud. It's all about your taste. Yep. And I think, too, sometimes – you know, you got kids that go to camps, and they're not good camp kids. Correct. Right? Definitely. Some kids, it's just they're better when the lights is on, with the pads on, 11 on 11. Right. They're not 7 I, on 7. Right. I've seen that. Or individual drills. I've seen kids that I, that can really go, that can really play when you see them on Friday nights. You put them in a camp setting, they look like a shell of themselves. Yeah. And, and sometimes I think that that could influence people on what they think about certain kids, too, because a lot of the time, let's be honest, you know, if it's a kid way up north that go to Rustin High School, right? Right. Nine times out of ten, I'm not going to see that kid playing person unless I see him at a camp. Or a state championship. Or a state championship or they play a playoff game down here, right? Correct. So, if I see him on just watching film, and I'm like, man, this kid could go. He could play. Yeah. Right? Then I see him at a camp, and he don't look the same as he do on film. Right. Now, and this is just me, I'm not going to just go off of that camp experience and say, oh, man, that kid ain't good. I got enough sense to know that some kids just not camp kids. Some, you know, you don't know. He might have went to three camps that weekend. His body might be worn down. No. You just don't know what has came into play. And I think that's another thing that people need to take into consideration. Like you said, you go see somebody play one time, this, they're kids. Some of them going to have up and down games. Some of them not going to have a level of consistency at this age, right? And I think that's what we got to do a better job of, you know, as media people that, we put it out, that content out there, and, and let people know, look, yeah, he might have had a bad game this, this, this game, but I've been following this kid for the last year and a half. I've seen him be a playmaker more often than not. Right, not just that, but, you know, let's go back to these rankings for two seconds. We didn't let you off the hook that fast, Sam. Listen, you know a lot of people's jobs on the line when it comes to these rankings. You know how we go out there trying to recruit kids. Mm-hmm. Some of these Power 5 schools, they, you know, they got – they got boosters. They got people. They got fans. They got people who said, man, we ain't getting enough five stars in the yeah, building. Yeah. And if we can't land some five stars around here, what kind of head coach we got? What kind of guy we who building these relationships? So how did that all work? Because at the end of the day, you got a lot of programs, these power five programs, these big business programs. If they got a whole list of recruits and they got a bunch of four stars and three stars and, and they got this three and four years straight <laughs> – Jobs coming, especially if the program is underachieving. You know, right. a lot sometimes these rankings can sway people's livelihoods. Especially the boosters. The boosters oh, definitely man. they definitely pay attention to oh, the they, rankings. They, they, and they, the they pay more attention to the rankings than yes. anybody in the world. Yes. <laughs> well, at that same point, you're right. If you're only recruiting four stars and three stars, you can go two ways. One, you're underachieving, you're upsetting a lot of people in, in uh, you know upstairs that are making decisions. Of course. Or you have a chance to, to prove something. You you know, I get a bunch of three stars that that's a media ranking mm-hmm. that turn into to power five studs that get drafted. Yep. You turn four stars and three stars. They're, like I said, those are good players under the right coaching and the right development. That changes your recruiting. I think you know. I think about obviously I'm 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 Louisiana centric, but I think about guys that have been three stars that have come under that you know 
less Racy McMath Racy. was a, a three-star. DJ, DJ Shark was three-star. D- DJ Chark was a three-star. Those guys are are playing in the NFL right now. Starting. Starting, starting DJ in Shark the NFL. starting for the Panthers. Yeah. You know. It, drafted him. It, <laughs> that's what I'm saying is you, you might be – doesn't mean that you're recruiting bad players. Those are still good players. It's the right. coaches that can make use of the five stars. Sometimes you have to recruit a couple of three stars and four stars to get to five stars. Um, you know, I think that, you know, I'm thinking about the Ed Orgeron era of LSU. He wasn't recruiting five stars until those four stars and three stars started to turn up. And, and then he was able to get some five stars. Mm, right. Um, you know, I, I think, it, you know, Georgia wasn't always recruiting five stars until they started to really kick it up under Kirby. And then they started to win. And then the five stars started to fall into place. But they had to win over a lot of believers first, like Cedric Van Pran, the number mm-hmm. one center in the country, country, to go out of state. But, like, it wasn't like Easter. Georgia was coming off back-to-back national championships right. when they were recruiting him. Correct. So it's recruiting it's coming, recruiting good players. It's coming off a loss from Bama for Devontae Tr- Smith. Tr- <laughs> trust your own evals. Coaches need to trust their own evals. Um it's the same way that if you're if you're behind the scenes of the rankings, you need to trust your own eyes. Yep. And these coaches, they have a lot of ways to get their hands on footage. They get they talk to a lot of people. Um, they're going to get as much information as they can. It's like being a, a, a scout in the NFL. It's yeah. it's doing your homework on these kids. I think that uh, like this weekend, right? We 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 got LSU versus Florida State box office, box office. Can't wait. Box I'm, office. I'm, I'm very excited about. I think this uh, game, may, this game is going to plateau one of these two teams throughout the season. Right. Um, I think that, you know, this is going to be one of those games that we talk about way when we get to week nine of the season. Like, man, that Florida State and LSU game, right? Yeah. Especially coming off of high ended last year. Yes. The following, rematch. what you following LSU over the years, following probably eighty percent. Of that roster that's on that's that's playing for LSU right now. Um, what's your expectations, man, for for the LSU Tigers in, in year two of with the Brian Kelly era? Um, you know, Jaden Daniels returning back for his second year at LSU, and they they calling him a Heisman hopeful. Um, what you think the LSU Tigers could do this year, man? Yeah, well, I've I've been very lucky, very blessed to cover a lot of those kids on both those rosters yep. at this point, which is yeah. it's, man, I cannot wait for the Sunday. kids that come out of Louisiana. Yeah, from that's those on that are Florida those, State roster. Those are those are some yeah. of my favorites. So it's Rudy it's Vance. it's very juicy. <laughs> um, I think LSU was in a really good spot to have a really good season. I think the SEC is kind of a, a bit of a crapshoot because I you can see it going a lot of different ways. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, no one wants to rule out the champs, but the champs have a whole new offense and a whole new quarterback. Alabama has a whole new offense and a whole new quarterback. Crushed the marks all over the board at Alabama. And and all LSU positions. is kind of the team that has a lot returning, kind of yeah, like A and M, yeah. kind of like A and M. So I I, I kind of don't discount either one of those teams from having a really good season. But LSU is strong in a lot of areas where they haven't been strong in the past. And I think there's there's two there's a couple of really strong areas. Their their front seven it's is, is right incredible. <laughs> <laughs> they, their offensive line is in the best offensive line they've had in a half decade. Which plus. was a question mark coming into the season last year. It's right. no longer a question mark, G. Right Will, left tackle. Will Campbell, <laughs> Lance Hurd, those those guys, Emory Jones, they, they have they have completely improved that under Brad Davis and, and Frank Wilson and, and uh Brian Kelly and, and the defensive front seven. I mean, Omar Spates coming in from the Pac twelve to yeah. to compliment Harold Perkins who by the way, Harold Perkins, when he was in high school, was the kind of kid that was just the best player on the field. But just imagine that was your linebacker who played Wildcat quarterback and caught passes and was running a four four nine on the field and did exactly what he did on defense at the high school level. It was such a sight to see. Um, and then you're going to get – obviously you're going to be without Mason for that first game, which makes mm-hmm. me all very nervous because I think Mason – man – he I know, just rubs I, so much. I know you're you're close with him, G, and and you know I am too. You made this this kid who has such a bright future. He might have already been in the NFL, you know, or, or if he's not close, he's he's getting ready for the NFL. Mm-hmm. He would have been the talk of the college football world last year. What what he was as a high school player and the work, yes. you know, that we see behind the scenes, and to take him out and just give him a year of getting angry, and then and then. You told him he couldn't play in the game and get you know revenge for that week one game last year that they lost. That they lost. He got I, hurt with the first series. First series. I would really hate to be their week LSU's week two opponent because that I mean I don't know what if there's a prop bet out but I'll take all the overs for Mason Smith yeah. that game. Yeah. Um, they are they are deep. You I mean you got guys like Jacoby and Guillory and and Wingo Wingo, Wingo 
yeah. and these are these are the important. The cornerback room makes me a little bit nervous. Mm-hmm. Um, the safety room is, but the the safety you, you room got is Major deep. Burns and you and you got Greg Brooks. I mean, so you, you those are veterans, and and those are two um, two t- locker room leaders, both of them, Major and Greg, and the running back room. People talk about maybe not deep, but I Logan, think it's deep. I I it's question is deep. I listen we, if Logan Diggs stays healthy. First if, of all, if if Giant Emery can get himself together, I can't help that. No, I can't. No, right? I, I think I, 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 can't I, do I, it. I can't I, do it. Y'all can that, do it. I can't do it. Listen, can't do it. listen right. think about it. Can't do it. Josh Williams, we saw what he can do last year as yeah. a walk on running back. We know what Giant Emery could do if he can go to class. Lil Kane's question mark, right? We know we saw Logan Diggs did yeah. we, at Notre Dame, and we know his ability just from yeah. covering him through high school. And that right? was a big recruit recruiting win for Brian Kelly over these Tigers. That's correct. This uh, is this is his guy, Logan Diggs, yes. that they brought yeah, back. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Amani Goodwin, I think he's de- he's dealing with an injury though. Huh? Right. Uh, and then you got the, the freshman, you know, Trey Howard, Trey Howard. Uh, Caleb Jackson, who had a really good fall camp. Right. So I think it's a really deep room and a real a really talented room, and when you got a lot of good veterans mixed with a lot of young talent, yes. I think that it's, and it's, it's very, very, like, spread out. But the, when you talk about big backs, you talk about backs that shifted, I just think they have a lot of different dynamics in that running back room that, um, depending on the team they playing that week, could give a, lot, give a, give a defense but, problem. But here's the concern, right? The concern is we're, we're comparing this backfield to potentially what we, what we – used to seeing from the back, but obviously when the new regime with Brian Kelly. But when you compare it to previous regimes, it's not the same backfield when you was looking at We don't know that yet though. When you We don't looking, know that yet. I'll say this. <laughs> we don't know that yet. Yeah, those LSU teams had some uh, Leonard Fournette to Darius Geis and mm-hmm. Nick Brosette to Clyde Edwards Hilaire. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it doesn't get much deeper than that. Yeah. If there is a position group that you want to be thin at or question I like the way G put it, it's just a lot of young guys. Young guys. With, with, with a couple of proven veterans Running back is, you know, we know what the value of running backs yeah. is. And I'm not saying that Logan Diggs isn't going to be a valuable part of this this offense because right. anyone who knows him from Rumble also knows a fantastic pass catcher out of the mm-hmm. backfield. Right. Um, it's If there's a question mark, I'd rather it be the running back room than the offensive or defensive line no or the quarterback. No doubt. That wide receiver room is as it's good as anyone in the, as deep, as deep, deep in the country. And we're talking about Georgia just lost their starting running back, Branson Robinson. So they're going to have a, a change. Mm-hmm. Alabama is going to usher in a new running back this year. And it doesn't mean that they're – we don't – it's just Rather they a question it, mark. It's yeah. the unknown. It's unknown across the board, from quarterback to O-line to receivers to the whole thing. And that's, <laughs> a, good, and that's a good point you made because last year running back was, you know, probably one of the weak links on the team on last the team. year, and they won 11 games. Correct. So if that room can show up just a little bit more a little than bit more they did than last, last year, year. right – this team will be pretty good offensively. I just think that when we talk about the LSU Tigers, if you think about a 20-year sample size, you just think about the amount of draftees that come out of the running back backfield. You're talking about where you're going back from Kevin Park to the Joseph Adai's to, I mean, from to the Justin Vincent. You start just, laying, just naming the list of backs that come into that. It's not that good. Now, can he be competitive? Can he be good? Absolutely, because we're in a different era running back. That era running back was a very much different group. You know, when you start talking about Stephen Ridley's of the world, you start talking about the the Jeremy Hills of the world, mm-hmm. you start talking about those the Leonard Fournette's of the world. It just the running back position is is just a different era right now. So it's a lot of I would say unknowns because I'm comparing it to what was drafted that came throughout LSU. I will say this though, Logan Diggs Logan Diggs is gonna get drafted one day. If John, oh, yeah. if, yes, if, if, I agree. If John agree. if John Emery ever got everything right off the field, yep. that kid is one of the best backs. He's you know, he's right there behind Leonard and one of the best backs I've ever seen up close, um, especially from this state. And you're talking about Trey Holly. Now, Trey Holly, one of the most productive high school football yep. players ever. All-time but, in Russia, huh? But, correct. And he was, I think, when he had that record season, he was fourth in the country out of Union Parish yes. High School. Give me a break. Yes. <laughs> but, but we're talking about future draftees. Caleb Jackson's going to get drafted one day. Mm-hmm. Um, he got injured as a senior, um, I think his first or second game of the season. Uh, but as a junior, I saw him in a playoff game against St. Thomas Moore, which you guys know is one of the more disciplined, mm-hmm. hard-nosed yeah. defenses Hard-nosed in defense. the state. And Caleb Jackson ripped them. Um, the combination of size, power, explosiveness, but also he's he's nifty and he can he can he can catch the backfield. From what I heard from the coaches at LSU, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's a, that's a guy that you know we 
might be an unknown now. But unknown maybe, now. But maybe all, next year when, when we're talking about their season for we're 2024. We're having a different discussion. You're talking about Caleb Jackson being one of the big pieces coming back to that backfield. And I yeah. do think, based on my evaluation of him in high school at Liberty, I think he'll be drafted one and day. I mean, yeah. And I think, I, think, I think he'll get some opportunities this season, right? Yeah. You know, like when they play Grambling Week 2, right? Yeah. We know... You know, the Logan Diggs and the Giant Emerys and the Josh Williams of the world are not going to play that whole the game. The whole game, correct. That's going to be a game where uh, Trey Holler and a Caleb Jackson can get, get an opportunity to show the LSU faith. Correct. What's to come? What's to come? In the future. And like I say, um, I think the last scrimmage they had, Caleb Jackson played phenomenal at running back. I think he had like a long 60-yard run or maybe it was a swing pass or something like that. Broke like three or four tackles. So he's showing the style that uh, the future is bright in that backfield. But I do want... Fast forward to that receiver room. Hmm. Listen, I think Ohio State and LSU had the two best receiver rooms in the country. I just think, I, that's, that's how I feel. You think followed by the USC coming third? Possibly. Possibly. <laughs> but when you talk about LSU, I think one of the things that LSU lacked last year, they had the length, they had the big body athletic receivers. They was missing that dynamic person that could blow the top off the defense, that could make people miss in space. They didn't add an Aaron Anderson to the fold, baby. Yes. Sam, you you familiar with Aaron Anderson? He went touchdowns <laughs> on Friday night. <laughs> you you familiar with him in Berman Stadium? Aaron, adding Aaron Anderson to the fold to go with Malik Neighbors, Kyron Lacey, Brian Thomas, Mason Taylor. We, we forget about Mason Taylor as a pass, pass catcher. Pass tight end. Let me give you another name. Camorian Pimpton. Another one. Two now tight you, end sets. Because you know uh, Denbrock like to run those two tight end Correct. sets. Mm-hmm. And so I just think they're going to have so many different weapons. It's going to be hard to game plan for this team. And when you add a dynamic person like Aaron Anderson who can make one person miss and hit and take it 80, I think this makes this offense damn near unstoppable. The key is going to be, though, can Jaden Daniels take that next step like Joe Burrow did in his second year? I completely agree, and, and Joe Burrows was, was was famous because obviously look at the results. But looking back at Aaron's career at, at Carr, I mean, I personally believe he's the best football player to come through Carr, and I know that over people speedy? over Speedy, and I and I say that over Speedy. <laughs> I don't know. It's arguable. It's and, arguable. Listen, it's I, arguable. I, I I brought it up when he graduated, and I got a lot of craziness, and then people were like, "Okay, maybe." Okay. Um, I'll say that over his career, Carr. I was talking about this with Shay Dixon at our LSU site the other day, and. I said, you know, when he was in the state championship as a freshman, he, he won he won them the game, and he nearly that. lost them the game because yep. of his fumbles. And then he had the COVID year. Right. And I have – you talk about what kid, kids' actions speak louder than words, and especially Aaron, who doesn't use a lot of his words until he needs to. Mm-hmm. That kid worked every single day on his hands. And then by the time when we saw – I remember seeing it at Natchitoches, as clear as day – Beating out not one, not two. He is five foot ten. Beating out three DBs. I don't even, I don't even know you that tall. He, and I and I, I remember talking to Bryce going into his senior year, and he goes, Bryce, Bryce is one of the smartest, most creative guys. I, I mean, and he texts me and goes, What do you think of Aaron? I said, I think he's. I think I'm gonna make him the. I think I'm gonna be the first, you know, analyst to make him a five star recruit. He goes, You know, he's only five ten. <laughs> and I said, I was like, You know, bet Bryce, gotcha. Right. What, that kid. I mean, him and Destin as the one-two punch in cars is, is yes. I mean, we're talking. We just talked about Racy earlier. We're talking about Speedy. I mean, that that combination was as good as it gets. Aaron is as I thought he was as good as a as a special teams return specialist as he was as a receiver. But that's not to diminish how great he was as a receiver because he right. was a crafty route runner. The only DB I really ever saw slow him down individually was Wallace Foster, who was mm-hmm. the son of a coach and one of the most technically sound DBs. Again, a freshman impact player for Jerry Phillips at Easton. Right. But what Aaron, the the consistent um, improvement in his hands, being five foot ten and able to jump, you know, 30, 38, 40 inches yep. in the air, yep. the twitch in space, the ability to make you miss. And, and really, I mean, Aaron is as tough as it gets. That's When you think about New Orleans tough, Aaron is exactly what you are he's thinking of. He, he's he, positive. For, for, exactly. And that's the kind of area that LSU is – I remember I talking to uh, to someone someone whose, fam, someone whose son is on the team, and they were saying, you know, I, I think they're just kind of lacking in that special teams department. Mm-hmm. Not you anymore. Could, you, not anymore. You could not have found a better hole no. uh, to fill it with. If, if he fills the shoes, which I, I believe he will, if that's the question mark on the, the Tigers this year, the special teams department, the, the punt return of a kick or the punt department. And we know Aaron Anson can pretty much, if you miss a tackle, <laughs> you will miss a tackle. Y'all are not going to like y'all special teams beating the following week. 
because it's about to be a highlight reel. If if he can just be focused, not that obviously he's going to play offense, but if he can make the plays there, I think the Tigers are, I don't want to compare them to the 2019 season, but it's shaping up to have a similar makeup. Mm-hmm. If they can, obviously one, if they can win week one. Florida State is going to be a real test because Florida State got some dogs of their own. And, and But if they could make this, if they could win in Orlando, this is a big-time matchup to me going in week one. To me, this this matchup here sets a real plateau of how college football is going to be shaped up towards this college playoff um, shape up. Obviously, I think that LSU can, even if they lost this game, I still think they have opportunities because of the conference they play in. And Florida State really doesn't have that kind of opportunity. Where if Florida State lost, no disrespect, the ACC does not have the teams that allows you to get back into that top four playoff, even if you win the conference. Because it's just not studied this year. Between them and Clemson, that's pretty much it. After that, it's just a, we don't know what we're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it, it's, it's shaping up to where we're looking at the targets this year, man. The light's going to be bright. This, this upcoming weekend, and if they could pull off this victory and get revenge on Florida State, which I'm neutral in this game, um, but <laughs> but it, I tell you one thing, man, it's gonna be it's gonna set off college football off in the right direction. It's like a grand opening of college football, and I and I'm just so excited for looking forward to this this matchup. But but you said something special, man. You said Aaron Harris is probably one of the best, you the know, best. I, 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 I come out of car. Mm-hmm. Questionable. Out of covering kids for almost a decade now in the state of Louisiana, in terms of recruit, five star, who you put at the highs of the ranking? Mm, that's a good question. Uh, yeah, I've I've been asked this a, a couple of times, and I I, I, I feel like come to mind. and I do feel like I kind of you know sometimes I I I stop myself from updating the list because it, I'm not asking you to go back twenty plus. I'm, not, I'm talking about from maybe two thousand twelve to now, somewhere around in there. That's my era. Um, yeah. I think it's going to be Derek Stingley Jr. Uh, and I think that 11 interceptions. Over Leonard. Over? Over Leonard. Yeah. Uh, I agree with it. 11 interceptions in, a, in 11 games okay. is the, one of the more okay. unheard of. I don't – it is okay. – I mean, you, you've seen this with when Kelvin Joseph was, was – I mean, with, when, when Greedy was in high it's, – it's really hard to take it, – it's really easy, rather, to take a, a four-star or a five-star DB out of the game. Derek Stingley didn't allow them to at any point. After the 11 interceptions, they obviously they moved them to safety. Yeah. They started using them on offense. And we're talking about the same thing as Aaron. He let him return kicks and punts. And it would be funny that you could pick a Dunham game and he would score. It was a guarantee, the same way you felt about Aaron. And I think there's just so few kids – where it's it's like you know it's you don't want to say this in a in a way where you know if you're going to see a four or five so you're expecting to see make some plays correct it's usually a sign if you're able to get taken yeah. out and if and those guys were you know you bring your popcorn every single week for those kind of guys and um you know I Derek Stingley I mean I, I don't say it, I say it pretty confidently but Leonard is uh Leonard really you know he he piqued my my really my love for for this city because I mean not only was he just the best. Mm-hmm. Never seen a human saying, look say, like this. Derek, and I, and I but, but when you talk Derek. to him after the game, Whew. he's an incredible person. No yeah, I saw him no in doubt. the airport no a couple of weeks ago with no his doubt. kids, and he's he's no the doubt. same Leonard. He's still no a 16 year old kid that gave away his his MVP trophy to the state champs, and you were like, "How do you you know?" Again, you you applaud the maturity for for kids that understand it like that. Yeah, I I, I think I would have to go with, you know. From 2012 to now, I'm torn between Joe McKnight and, and Speedy Noel. Right. Uh, the things I've seen Joe McKnight do. And when I say that, I'm talking about with my own eyes. I'm not talking about watching film or anything. I'm talking about up close and personal, seeing them do this on a Friday night. Nah. And I think Joe McKnight and Speedy Noel, from, if you talk about from 2012 to now, those two guys. I, I, I got a guy that I, you, Arguably, that's the two best I've seen. I got a guy that you... We'll put in that mix. Who? Puka Williams. <laughs> I stand corrected. I stand corrected. I stand corrected. Puka. Puka magic, baby. So, so, so look, I would put Puka before both of them, but the reason why I said Joe and Speedy because yeah. when you when you see Joe McKnight and Speedy with their shirt off, yes, yeah, Joe Joe just Joe just got the got they the, they, uh, they 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 look like. They going to the NFL. Yeah, yeah. When you see Puka with his shirt off, you just see Puka walking around. <laughs> just Puka. You would never think that 
man, this kid is one of the best players in the country. That's a, you bad, that's that. a badass until, mother. Boy. Until he lays him up. Yeah. Until he lays him up. So, boy, uh, talk about a dead leg, boy. That yeah. playoff don't, run don't, is, yeah. that, I mean, that probably is the best that, playoff run. The best run. playoff run I've, I've seen. Who else has a nickname for the, for the, for the five or six game stretch of the Superdome? I mean, for real. Puka Magic, it was a, was a phenomenon in this state. Yes. And you heard teams from across the, is he really that good? I was like. Yes. Dude, yes. it's not an accident that they're winning this game. It's like no, it, 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 but he was a and he was a kid. I thought that um, people didn't talk about a whole lot until his senior year. Correct, because Puka didn't really go to camps like that. He right. he, he, he just went, he went he to kind of stayed out the weight. He almost got the offer from Jaluk, mm-hmm. um, but I think he had to leave because his grandmother went to the hospital. Mm-hmm. So it's like. It's un, you know it's it's a completely you yeah. know unforeseen unforgiving situation that you know probably hindered him from getting the offer because I'm pretty sure he clocked like a four four or sub four four yeah. forty but he didn't get to work out and it, it delayed his, his recruitment with LSU. Well, I remember the first ever camp he ever went to. I took him to it at Tulane. That's when CJ was the head coach at Tulane and, and Coach Dave Johnson was there. His first time ever going to a camp. This was going into his ninth grade year. Mm-hmm. He ran a four three. <laughs> Right, <laughs> and they they offered him on the spot. He didn't even have varsity film yet, and uh, I I, I want to say he went to maybe like one rivals camp after that, and he didn't even perform all of the drills, drills. at the rivals camp. I don't even think he did the one on ones. I think he might have did like maybe the first ten minutes of the rivals camp, and then he like said his leg was hurt, and he just went and sat down. He just wasn't that kind of kid that wanted to do camps, camps and just be available, right? If you will, and I think that probably hurt. Uh, his recruiting, like, because he didn't go camps at, at schools. Correct. He didn't do that. And I think that was a big reason why um, schools were leery of offering him because, I mean, he is 5'7", some change. He, you know what I mean? Yes. But uh, I do want to ask you this, Sam. Give me a name on LSU roster that nobody's talking about that will make some type of impact on that LSU team this year. Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess I have to – I kind of – Tip my hand a little bit with Kamori and Pimpton, but you know, um, you know, you mentioned Denbrock is, you know, we have yeah. uh, Jason Taylor's son, Mason, Mason, is the famed tight end, and Mason is a really gifted receiver, and Kamori mm-hmm. and Pimpton is a is a kid from from right outside of Dallas Fort Worth. Um, I saw him in the All American game last January. One, I also got to see him at the Red Stick Jamboree on on Friday night in Baton Rouge. Mm-hmm. This kid is about six foot six. Uh, two hundred and twenty-ish pounds. Stand next to Shelton Sampson, who y'all have seen at six foot four, one hundred and ninety pounds, is a grown man, and he makes Shelton look like his little brother. Um, I've heard a lot of good things that this guy is. You know, he was kind of raw coming out of high school, but he's fit right into the LSU weight, weight program, making yep. a lot of plays during scrimmages. And listen, you're talking about one of the strengths of this team is the, is not only the the talent of the pass catchers, but the deep talent of the pass catchers. And if you're looking for, listen, there's not a lot of names off the radar that I can really throw at you because a lot of these names are now household names. I'm not going to surprise you with Malik Neighbors or, you know, or right. something like that. But uh, Kamori and Pimpton might be, you know, Mason Taylor did it as a freshman. Mm-hmm. Yeah. LSU's not afraid to play if you're able to play, and it might just be a name to stash away. I'm going to go with, I'm torn between these two guys. Javian uh, Toviano, uh, I, I, I love everything about that kid. He is, in my opinion, just being around a program uh, in the summer and going to some of the practices during fall camp, I think he might be, and I, this ain't no disrespect to none of the freshmen, but I think he might be the most mature out of all of the freshmen. A million uh, percent. The goals about it with this business-like approach, uh, catching on to the defense really, really well. And I think that, with the secondary being sort of a question mark, I could see the the secondary having some little inconsistencies okay. a, a little bit early okay. on and Toviano kind of getting some opportunities and him living up to the bill of making some plays here and there to help LSU win a few games. I'm not saying he's going to go out there and be what Howard Perkins was, right? right? But I think Toviano is somebody to look out for this season that could possibly put – Get everybody like kind of excited about him and his future going forward. What the other guy I was gonna say was Savion Jones, but Savion kind of started coming on last year. Yeah. So people probably kind of know about Savion. You know, he's gonna be starting at the age. Yeah, he's probably St. James. And you, 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 yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. People kind of know Savion's probably about incredible think, senior season. Yeah, yes. Yeah. yeah. People, you know, I think people kind of know about Savion, but I think Toviano is somebody that I'm kind of looking forward to seeing 
Uh, well, to that no. point, he he started he started as a freshman for Arlington Martin out there in in, in Arlington. Um, mm-hmm. As a sophomore, I saw him in his week one game, and I, this is how we talk about exposure. I made his profile in in Cowboy Stadium. <laughs> he lined up against Jatavian Sanders, and then he lined up against Billy Bowman, and then he 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 broke up passes against both of them mm-hmm. over and over. And, and of course, Billy caught a couple on him. Jatavian caught one on yeah. him. This is a sophomore. He was six foot one, 180 pounds as a sophomore. His brother played ball um, somewhere in the, in the state of Texas. Um, so he's the younger brother. You talked about his mentality. This is a grown man mentality. Yes. He's extreme. One of the sharpest young men yep. I've ever been, you know, fortunate enough to cover. And the way they used him at Arlington Martin, I mean, they let him be the running back. They let him play corner. They let him play safety. I think he's playing in the nickel a lot at LSU. Um, toolsy, smart. Driven, I have no. T- I I think I'm a, I'm a G 100. percent That's a freshman that that I could see yeah. playing in that secondary he, he, very uh, quickly. And, and, and you got to think about this. Major Burns has been having a lot of durability issues Correct. since he's been at LSU. I mean, he's wearing the, the neck collar, the horse collar, on uh, to protect his neck. Um, you know they like to take Greg and move him to the nickel. nickel. And I think something else that bodes well for Toviano, the versatility. You yep. can put him at safety, safety. and you can put him at nickel. And you can out, kind of put him at outside corner if you Play, want to. Plays outside corner right? a ton in high school. Right. And so Madhouse and Steeples known, right, they love that versatility that Toviano brings Correct. and his maturity and the way he approaches the game. So I could see him getting an opportunity this season, whether it's, you know, against an old Miss, whether it's against Auburn, whether it's against Florida State yeah. on Sunday. I think he gets an opportunity at some point yeah. and makes the most of it and we start getting what excited about Toviano. What do you think about, about the Terrence? Welch. Welch. I think Latarian is going, I, you know, I know he's running with the tools. He'll be the first guy in mm-hmm. an outside corner if uh, Alexander, Alexander and uh, Deuce Chest- Chestnut goes down, Go down. Or they, they need a breather. LT will be one of the first guys up um, to rotate in. You know, I think LT had a really, really good fall camp. I went to three practices, and I thought LT body looks better. Um, yeah. He's moving better than he did looks last healthy. year coming off the ACL. So um, he's Health, on a, health has always been the issue yeah, with LT. And, and it's, he had a hell of a spring game. Hell of a spring game. He's a ball player every time he's on the field. He's yeah, he's, he's 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 what nicked up his senior year a little bit. Then obviously a lot, he, a and lot. He, we were talking about when Junior he came back. Though. Yes, when he came back though, he always made plays and in the biggest spots. Yeah. And I just think that he's gonna, you know, when the opportunity presents itself, I think he's gonna take the stage. But I'm, obviously, this guy here is not gonna be, you know, he's a household name or somebody. I just think, I think Kyron Lacey is just posed to just Hold have up. a big season. I don't want to be biased. Yes, I think that he just posed to have a big season. I just think that. He's ready for this stage. If you've been watching him in fall, in, in, in fall camp, just the plays he's making, dog. Number two is coming, and I just think that obviously you got Brian Thomas, obviously you got Malik Neighbors, but number two is the guy that I got to highlight on this year because his his ceiling is just like if he gets the kind of coverage that he wants to get, it's a highlight reel. He's gonna put you on center stage, and that's yeah. the thing that it. Is going to fit well to what they want to do as an organ as a team. He's going to, to me, number two is going to make that play that like, okay, we've been kind of like, ah, we ain't moving the offense well. Well, you find number two. This whole this whole situation is about to change. Right. I just think that Kyron Lacey it becomes a household name. But obviously, if you follow him, you know, high school like G has, and obviously, like I've been following him when he was at, you know, UL. But being on this stage. And, and to your point, you know, Cortez Hankton has raved about him. Uh, the person that he has become from spring to now, to now. versus what he was a year ago, ago. around his time, maturity-wise, um, just understanding to have better practice habits. Um, I think that was a big issue for him last year. You know, at UL, you can kind of get away with not practicing the right way because you know you're the best person in the room. He knows the best person in the room. When you come to LSU, you're not the best but you're not the best person in the room. There's other guys in that room that's just as good as you, if not better than you, and you have to come with good practice habits every day. If you don't, you're going to have a game like he did against Texas A&M, you know, where he had some crucial drops. And I think that's something that resonated with him that got his mind right. And I think you, you're you right, bro. I think Kyron, Kyron. Uh, is on the cuffs to having a big, big season. Another question for you, Sam. What's a guy in high school right now that nobody's talking about, but at season's end, a lot of people going to be talking about. Mm. Mm. Any, any any specific part of the state or anywhere don't matter. can I hit? Don't matter. Don't matter. Don't matter. Don't matter. Don't matter. Oh, man. It's got to be Louisiana, though. It's got to be. Hey, that's easy. Um, <laughs> all right. 
Let me let me give you Davian Jackson out there in, in Westgate. He's a he's a 2025. He's going to play receiver this year. He worked okay. he worked in the backfield last year with uh with uh for, for, I'm going to coach Westgate. Coach, coach, coach Ryan Antoine's going to Antoine's gonna, Coach Antoine's going to kill me. I think it's Gordon is in the backfield. But mm-hmm. Davian Jackson is a as a as a freshman. They said you thought Kayshawn Booty was tough. Wait till you see this kid. So they they have not tempered their expectations with Davian. He's already got an offer from Tulane and Georgia Tech. Um, I saw what he did in his jamboree. He's basically a power slot, um, and and he is physical. He's got incredible hands, great body control. He can get up after it. He's got a nice vertical jump, um, and he's just a junior. So they got a, a young squad, and that Jabari Antoine, 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 Antoine and Davy yep. and Jackson, and they got some a couple more youngsters that we're gonna start hearing more all over. They think that they're gonna be state championship bound, and and if they are, I think Davy and Jackson will be uh, someone whose recruitment will take off in the process potentially. Give me a high school team that nobody's talking about right now that we'll be talking about when playoff time comes. Has anyone talked about the Car Cougars on the show? <laughs> um, I mean, come on. I mean, listen. Get the Shannon Shaw spokes pushing right down. Well, I, I know, but here. Well, I'm, well I'm, in a, I'm, in a safe, I'm in a safe place. I don't think that I don't think they're being picked to win the Catholic League, and I don't have to do that Surprisingly. anymore. Surprisingly. I don't have – but here's the thing. They're very – they are young, and they, but they might be the most talented. There, I've seen some. I, I, I'm, I'm a star chaser, right? That's what right. I do. Right. Some of the most talented teams I've seen, and and it starts with Carr, Carr, and Destrehan. Destrehan. Um, U High. Westgate. Westgate. Catholic. The Westgate. Um, they're starting to get some dudes back up north. Appaloosas. Appaloosas. Captain Shreve. A couple of these pro. John Everett has some some young guys. Everett got a couple uh, guys. Got a couple guys. in that class with all the schools in Jefferson Parish closing down. Uh, yes, yeah, but I'll tell you all that uh, on cars, guys on the defensive line and in the receiving core, it's like their bread and butter. And it and in the secondary and just seeing them, you know, I'm, I'm spoiled. I got to see them in the spring game. I got to see them in their preseason scrimmage, but. The youngsters are going to be not only they're going to be playmakers this year, I'll be doing it for two or three more years, and you start giving them some experience. That's a really high ceiling for not only this year potentially, but as a learning you know series, but next year and then the year after, they're going to be the favorites in the Catholic League. I, I'm going with uh, Abelousas High School, and preferably because of the division they're in. You know, I was looking at where they where they fall at in that division. I think they're in nine select division. I can't remember, but they don't have any juggernauts in that division at the end. Yeah. So I feel like Opelousas could possibly be a team that we start talking about come playoff time that might be in the quarterfinals or the semifinals, right? Yeah. Um, I think Coach Jimmy has done a, a, a fantastic job taking over that program and um, building some confidence in those kids. And I think they made it to the second round last year mm-hmm. or something like that. So they – and they have some star-studded kids on that team. And, and they have some kids on that team that I think we're going to find out about. My other one is – Holy Cross. Hmm. I'm not saying Holy Cross is going <laughs> to go to the dome, right? But they won, what, three games last year? Four games, yeah. something like that? I think Holy Cross has a winning record this year. I can see them going six and four, maybe seven and three. I think Coach Wadney um, is bringing a, a, a level of discipline to that team. Um, I think he's 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 catering his defense and his offense to what they do best. Mm-hmm. And, look, when you talk about somebody like Kobe Young yeah. and Cross Johnson, if he's healthy, um, along with that, the, the quarterback I forgot his name. He's coming back. He started last yeah. year. Good quarterback, right? Um, the O line play, which is with Watney's, uh, his young playmakers yeah, in there. His, yeah, Watney's forte is the offensive line. So I think that O line will be better. And when you got two playmakers like Kobe Young and Cross Johnson with a veteran quarterback coming back, I think that Holy Cross team is going to be really good. Then you added somebody like uh Tommy Connors, right. uh, who came from Shaw, who's a defensive minded guy. You got Chris Thompson, who has been a college coach at Nickel State for the last. Six, seven years. This is his second year at Holy Cross. I just think when you add all those components, Holy Cross should be should have a winning record this year. So I'm gonna go with Holy Cross and Opelousas High School. Man. I like those. John Everett. Man, you what man, come on, you fired, <laughs> man. What about Higgins? We not we not in the conversation. They're not feel good a team this year. <laughs> We're not in the conversation. We may go down to three years sooner or later. <laughs> we listen, I love my guy Clipper. I love Clipper, but we ain't there. Right. I love him. Right. Loving the dead boat. No, and ain't. look, and, and, ain't and look, they ain't making no better for him. Helicopter closed down, and John Eric get all get all, all, all the studs. Of course. They just, now, now that, speaking of that, that's a sleeper in the state. I feel like gonna take a lot of people by storm this year. Darnell O'Quinn. Oh yeah. 
bro. Yeah. That kid could play. Mm-hmm. Now he's 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 a little slim. A little slight. But the when you talk about twitchiness, yeah. getting in and out of his brace, high pointing it, being able to run. He got verified track times. Darnell O'Quinn, if they can get him the ball, which I, uh, Eric's quarterback is pretty solid. Solid, he's solid. He I think Darnell O'Quinn will be somebody that when we look back week nine, week ten, is is getting some 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 steam for us. A lot of schools starting to recruit him because I think right now he only got like maybe like three or four offers. Yeah, well, you know what? It's it's this is this is what we're talking about a senior eval kid. Um, he's a, he's a ball player. He's just he's a little slight. Um, you, you watch watch the McNeeses, the the. The southeasterns, the Nichols, mm-hmm. they they know where to find talent. They're gonna be they're gonna be watching him, and and there'll be a lot of eyes on Eret. He's gonna have a lot of opportunities. Eret, not only they're gonna use Wardell Mack on offense, they got oh, a yeah, really Wardell. good running back. Um, they're gonna need Darnell, and I've I've seen him do it in seven on seven yeah. settings. I've seen yeah. him do it at a couple of Eret practices. Yeah. This kid is always making a circus. And catch before he got hurt crazy. last year for Helen Cox, I think he only played like four or five games mm-hmm. last year. But if you go look at his film from his junior year, bro, he was balling. Yeah, too bad he couldn't be a hurricane. <laughs> Before we go though, man, we gotta do Sam's favorites, man. Favorite, Sam's man. favorite. Here we go. Here we go. Here we Uh-oh. go. Favorite football player of all time. Oh. No matter what level. No matter what level. Uh, I grew up and I loved Jonathan Vilma. Mm. That's a good one. Saint. I loved him when he was a Jet. He brought us a Super Bowl. <laughs> oh, he loved him when he was a Jet. He led the NFL in tackles with the Jets. He mm-hmm. did. And then we traded him. And then him. they traded him, and that's yeah. just kind of the organization of I grew course. up in. They went from a four three to three four. Couldn't fit. Couldn't fit. Come known down here because uh, what Rex Ryan? Rex Ryan, came Ryan took over. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Favorite movie of all time? Oh my god. Ah, uh, I'll go with The Godfather. I think the cliche one. Good one. Go one. Like Only that. because I just recently watched it. And I can't think. Go one. Go one. Go one. Nice. Favorite sneaker of all time? Hmm. I gotta go with my dunks. Mm, good one, good one. Your mm. favorite artist of all time, music artist. Music artist. Um, I love the Foo Fighters. I never heard of Foo Fighters. They like Dave Grohl. Yeah. Okay. 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 Gotcha. All right. Different. <laughs> <laughs> See, he taking it back though. He taking it back like from like if you, most people we, we have guests who have on, they will have some modern of the modern era. Oh like, yeah, no, I'm I'm living in my own world, man. <laughs> I live in my own world. Man, he they fool fight. I, I, I I was driving with uh, one of my coworkers who was like 26 years old, and he was like, "Man, Sam, your Spotify is crazy." He's like, <laughs> it went from like Frank Sinatra to like Liquid <laughs> to Drake, and I'm like, "Man, that's what happens when you're old. You just like a lot of different songs. I don't know." Yeah, he in the future. It's <laughs> <laughs> the baby. This is what history is like, man. Favorite place to visit? Um, man, I I love California so much. Um really anywhere in California. That's like my go-to place. Um, but now my new favorite place to visit is back home on Long Island because my, my new niece. Mm-hmm. Um, and she is a little flower of my world. Gotcha. Gotcha. Favorite coach of all time, whether it was like somebody you watched growing up yeah. or uh, maybe it might have been a coach that made an impact on you. Hmm. I hope he, he listens. I want to say Robert Valdez, former coach of West St. John. I mean, does anyone not love him? <laughs> Um, we gotta get my dog. That's yeah, my dog. he's just a great guy. I give, I'll give him that. I'll give only because Bryce is still coaching the high school. I can't mess. I don't want to upset Jerry. I can't be. <laughs> Curry, I will, Valdez is retired from the game. He's a grandpa now. I'm sure he, he could use uh, some pep. Favorite comedian of all time. Tough. That's, that's tough. This is also a whole one with different eras too, right? Yeah. Um, who's uh? What's the, who did Olivia Munn just marry? That guy's kind of up on my idols Olivia right now. Olivia Munn. Uh, I know she's a date. John Aaron Mulaney. Rogers. I can go with John Mulaney. John Mulaney. I mean, sh- maybe not all time though. I like going, Olivia. No, Munn. it don't have to be uh, your, yeah. your favorite. Sam's yeah, I'll, favorite. I'll say Sam's favorite at the moment is John Mulaney. Kind of a moment. John Mulaney. Hmm. You got one for him? I don't. Thinking about one. Thinking about one. Same like he listen to, listens to um. If you want these new matter kids, what it is, Matt Riff. It's all over the internet right now. Mm-hmm. But Sam like he listen to uh who 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 it is the guy. Oh. Tip of your tongue. <laughs> I think it's Burr. 
can't think of the first name. Ah, some tip my tongue. I can't get it off. Can't get it off. An artist? No, so it's a comedian. Oh, comedian. Oh, Bill Burr? Yes. <laughs> I, I, I recently, dude, here's, I'm just like out of touch with like modern, like right. someone just told me who that was. Like I had to like Google who that was. I found so, that in the last year. I also like. You funny? I saw his last kind of, on, on, I saw his last stand up on, on, on Netflix. Right. And I found it funny, especially when you start talking about the WNBA. <laughs> it's, listen, you know, but you know, I'm passionate about women's sports, but the way he was going in, I was just like, I can't fault him. <laughs> I can't. I couldn't fault him. For, I couldn't fault him for how he made what his position was and how he made it <laughs> funny. Right. Like he's like, hey, I understand what he's saying, but he made it funny. And they were just like, I couldn't watch the whole thing because the whole thing doesn't really pertain to the things I'm interested in. But when he was start talking about the WNBA and why it is the way it is, I couldn't stop watching. Come on, it was funny like that. Oh, it was funny. <laughs> It was funny. He said, nobody watch, he was like, nobody watch the games. <laughs> <laughs> if, you, if you wasn't doing sports media, what would Sam Spook going to be doing with his life? <sighs> right in the living section. Tom speaking you. <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> um, I would love – I love arguing, so I think I probably would have maybe stayed on that law path. Like, <clears throat> But I would, I would have had to do it earlier in life because – Man, once I once you got a taste of like doing the media stuff, I really enjoyed it, and and that's what I said. That's why I stuck with it. But um, you'd have been defense prosecutor. What you'd have been? Shit, man. Whatever made me the most money. <laughs> man, I would I would have been working my butt off harder in school and getting it done with early. If now now that you know now kids can graduate high school early and stuff, I would I'd be like, oh, I can get out of this and yeah. do move ahead. Let's do it. Definitely been a defense attorney. Working for the state, don't pay. Yeah, <laughs> I was thinking like I'd be like a divorce they attorney or something. Like man, yeah. people get divorced every day. A lot of civil suits. Yeah, yeah. come on. Yeah. I know one yeah. thing: they make do make a lot of money. They make a lot of money. They, that that they retainers, <laughs> for real. That retainer ain't no joke. Yeah, hey, I want to be like a ret- one of those attorneys. Like, yeah, I'm like I'm just like the, the I'm Apple's attorney. Like, yeah, yeah. gotcha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They, 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 they retainer like a hundred k. Yeah. Yep. He said, he said, Sam said he's like Sam said he likes to argue. I t- don't argue with the kids on Twitter. Oh no no no! I, in, they, don't don't get into it. They, they have no recollection of of anything. It's like just to the, just to hear them speak. And I be trying to have one of those for them. I'm trying to let them in the conversations. They just can't get here. The I'm a things, mu- I'm a muter. I'm it's a lose mute. lose. It's a lose lose. It, Social media is not the way to communicate. Nah, nah, it's a lose lose. I'm with you, Sam, because these kids today, the things they say, when they, especially when it comes to rankings. <laughs> when they rank, want to rank people, when they want to rank athletes, even the athletes are starting to bother me. Even if you're tw- under third, if you're a player, I don't want to hear you. I just don't. Like, this, just the conversations, when you hear them, it, it, it regardless of a sport, it don't matter if it's football, basketball, music, it does not matter. You hear them, like, when you just hear them, you be like, who? Who you got up there the whole time? Like, just say that's your favorite. Right. It, and now exactly. Cool. But when you get them, it's like they are no historian of the music, sports, or com- comedy. It does not matter. It's like they're not. It's like to them, this all started in two thousand. Sure. Well, like, for them, it did start in two thousand. Yeah, it did. But <laughs> but that's like for me, for example, right? If I like, if somebody asks me, man, who's some of the best receivers of all time? I'm not just going to start with Terrell Owens and Randy Moss because that's the era I watch. I'm going to dig a little back and see, okay, that's Steve Largent. There's Don Hudson, right? There's some guys who played this game. Well, look, I will say to some of the kids' defense, they need to probably articulate themselves better and say, my era, this my is my era. favorite. Yeah. When, when I would they, say that Randy Moss probably is better than those guys, though. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. I'm just messing with you. I, just yeah. Yeah. Admit, I, can't, I can't speak on guys. <laughs> I can't speak, like, you know, we be talking about the NBA stuff sometimes, and they start talking about Bill Russell and all, I'm like, bro, I, I could go off of some of the classic games I watched on ESPN. Like the black and white film yeah, but on I, ESPN 2 after midnight. I, I, didn't, I, didn't, I, I didn't watch that. I didn't so watch. I, I'm, I don't, I'm not going to ever put Bill Russell in my top. It, it's, it's like putting Jim Brown in your best argument for right. running back. It's like, you know, no disrespect, right. but I didn't watch the game in the 60s and 70s. Right. Now, you, Walter Payton, like, I, don't, I, I didn't watch those guys. I just nah, saw highlights and stuff on NFL right. films. No. Nah. I, I'll put them in my conversation. Obviously, my era was the Emmitt Smith and the Barry Sanders. Sanders and then the Damian Thomas and the Marshall Fox, you know, in, in that group. The Terrell Davis is of the world. You know, Terrell Davis ain't, like, top ten, but he won an MVP. You know, that era, right? But when you hear them speak, you be, they, the things they say, you be like, 
Who? Come on now. No, no. It's like y'all. Do y'all have a study for stats and statistics and in in numbers and? They not they not thinking before they talk. No, no, not at all. It's just like no. the stuff they say. You be like, who? And then you be like, listen, the guy's having a good start to his career. The guy's on the right path. If he can keep it up, he gonna move some people out the way. And look, the days, <laughs> the times we living in now, everybody to go. Yes, I'm so damn tired of seeing that damn emoji. <laughs> listen, like God damn, how y'all call everybody a go? Come on, man. Guy have a great season. Oh, he the go. You be like, who? <laughs> Come on, man. You be like, it, it has to, you know, I don't know, sometimes some things just need some level of context and it's getting out of proportion. You know, it's just like, come on, let's, no. It is what it is, It man. is what it, it is. It is what it is. The, 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 the man, guy. I appreciate you coming on the, on the Fan View Podcast, Sam, man. You got, we definitely got to get you back on in the near future. Football season is upon us. Yes. I'm pretty sure I'm going to see you at some games on Friday oh, yeah. nights. Yes, you are. Uh, and probably some LSU games, maybe, huh? We'll see. We'll yeah, see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, big news to, coming out tomorrow down there in Acadiana. Uh, Dominic McKinley will be announcing where he'll be spending his next three to four years. Some people saying Oklahoma. Some people saying Texas A&M. Some people saying Austin. You have a slight few people saying LSU. We'll see tomorrow. I'm pretty sure Sam's going to be all on top of that. Uh, I'm going to be on top of it from afar. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll see. We'll see, fight. man. We'll see, man. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate you coming on the podcast, though, Sam, man, uh, and everything you do, man. I know, you, like I said at the beginning of the podcast, uh, one of the hardest working, if not the hardest working man yes. in media, man. Uh, you know, I, I don't know how your your wife pick uh, puts up with the long days and the long nights, man. I don't, I don't know how she do it. <laughs> you, you could ask her. I don't know. I don't. She left town, man. She might, she might be saying goodbye. Who even knows? But I appreciate. <laughs> I appreciate you guys having me. You guys, like I said, you guys do an excellent job. And, no doubt, uh, no G doubt. for you anything, man. I got you. No doubt. Appreciate you. Listen, everybody, get subscribed. Fanview Podcast if you're on YouTube. Fanview Podcast if you're on IG. It's Fanview Podcast if you're on Facebook. It's Fanview Nola. If you're on Twitter, also TikTok, Fanview Podcast. Don't forget to follow G Sports if you're on YouTube, if you're on IG, if you're on Twitter. I cannot help you if you're underneath the rock. We all got a little thing called devices here. Yeah. You know, you got to like. Comment, share, subscribe, watch, tell a friend, tell a friend. It's the best. It's the best damn podcast in the state, baby. Can't stop, won't stop. Can't stop, won't stop. Fan view podcast. We out. <laughs>